Hello everybody, how are we doing? So, in light of COVID-19 being a massive pain in the bum, we are going to do our lessons via video. So, this is aimed at those doing pilot nav, um, also applicable to air nav as well. Um, Pippa, what are you doing? Um, However, if you're not doing those subjects and you want to watch, I'm not going to stop you. Fill your boots, go for it, uh, enjoy. So this particular lesson, we're going to talk at a reasonably high level about the different ways we can navigate. And then in later videos, we'll actually go into a bit more depth uh, about how you do that. Now, as you can see, we're using a uh, simulator for this. Uh, this is um, FSX, Microsoft Flight Sim X. Uh, it's oh, quite old now. It's old hat. Um, it's been around over 10 years. Well over 10 years, I think, actually. Um, <coughs> this is what I've got at home. It's slightly different to what we have on Squadron. We use X-Plane on Squadron. Um, differences in the way it does its computation and things like that but largely it, it, it's the same um, I'm currently mid-flight at the moment uh, in a, an airliner so we'll we'll talk first about sort of basic nav um, on the ground then we'll talk about airliners because they're, they're a smidge easier um, and then we'll talk about uh, VFR which is visual flight rules um, and the, the little aids we've got uh, to assist us there in terms of radio aids. If we're on the ground, how do we navigate? Have a, have a bit of a think. What do we use to help us get from A to B? Well, let's keep it dead simple, first of all. If you're walking into town, you use landmarks, whether that be road signs or street names or you know you turn left at Sainsbury's and then walk for a quarter of a mile and then turn right at, at Tesco's or whatever they're, they're all landmarks now when we're out walking obviously these landmarks are quite close together um, and quite prominent in in that regard from what you can see at eye level if you're out doing your DV though and you're out in the countryside landmarks might be Big mountains, a lake, a river, stream, a fence, pylon, radio mast, so on and so forth. These are all perfectly valid ways of navigation, um, micro-navigation, as you might sometimes hear it called. We don't need a compass for any of that, we don't need a GPS, we don't need any radios, you can just look and see where you're going. That is a perfectly valid form of navigation um, when it comes to aircraft as well. If you're in something small, light, and you're not travelling very far, the problem is, one, well, what if you lose your way and you don't recognise any of the landmarks that you can visibly see? What if it's bad weather, or you're above the cloud, or it's night time? Night time poses its own little quirks, actually, because it's very easy to see cities at night because they're lit up. Um, and if you have a rough idea where you are, you'll be able to have a rough idea of the city you're looking at. Um, the sun's going down at the moment uh, on the simulator, and we're, we're flying into London. But as we're going over Paris um, and sort of that sort of area, we'll have a look out the window, and we'll see some of these things that you can see during during night time. Uh, and how they're really actually quite visible. Particularly motorways are also very visible at night time. If they're lit, of course. Um, if you're going a long way, or you're at 36,000 feet, I think we're currently at. Let's have a quick a quick squiz. So, oh, 38,000. We've done a bit of a climb. Uh, 38,000 feet, then... Well, as you can see, all right, the scenery is not, not amazing on here. It'll get better as we enter into Europe. But visual references aren't particularly useful. Now, we're just crossing the Mediterranean at the moment, I think. Let me just have a quick look-see. Um, oh, no, we're, we're well past that. We're actually coming up towards Venice. 
So I will show you where we are. I need to put my centre screen on for that. Here we go. So this is us. Oh, hello. Speedbird 154. Um, out of Cairo. That's that's where we set off from. I, I wasn't recording then. Over, over Crete, over Greece. Albania, up the coast of Croatia. Uh, and we're coming up sort of towards Venice um, here. Um, forget what sea that's called. Is that the Black Sea? No, that's the Black Sea. Ah, I can't remember. Anyway, it's part of the Mediterranean. Uh, we'll go over the Alps at the top of Italy. That will be very easy to spot. Um, over sort of Switzerland. I can't remember our exact route. Let's have a look. So this is pretty zoomed out. Can I zoom in on there without it going nuts? A mm, little bit. So we're going pretty much over the top of Venice there, if you can just about make out the mouse pointer. Over the Alps, over the east side of Switzerland, across France. Paris is around about here, so we'll be going right over the top of Paris. And then we'll be entering into UK airspace, pretty much over the White Cliffs of Dover, which is another very good visual landmark. Um, and actually what they use during the war, quite often. Um, hence the song, uh, Bluebirds Over the White Cliffs of Dover, if you look through the lyrics of that. It's... Uh, it was something that the pilots looked for on the way home, and it, it knew you knew that you were over friendly territory once you went over those white cliffs. Uh, and into Heathrow. So let me just get my zoom back on there, and let's dump that over onto the screen and sort out screen capture. Here we are. Uh, I'll leave the sound off just for the time being, because that'll get quite annoying. So, okay. What if we can't use landmarks? What else do we use when we're out doing DV and so on and so forth? Well, the obvious one is a compass. Um, compass gives you a good indication of where north is. And if you have a map and a rough idea where you are, you can then get a better idea of where you are by doing some triangulation. So you can see a mountain over there. You know what bearing it is to you. So you can draw a bearing off that landmark, uh, draw a straight line um, on your map, then you find another man landmark, or oh, I can see a radio mass, it's probably that one there, get a bearing to that, and then when those two lines cross is where you are, um, and the more points you get, the more accurate uh, that becomes. Not too dissimilar to how GPS works, we'll talk about that a bit later. A compass is pretty useful. Um, it gets less useful the faster you're going, and it gets very not useful if you're anywhere near something that's big and metallic, or has a magnetic field, um, like for example uh, in Edinburgh, compasses aren't very good there, it's built on granite, the granite has quite a lot of iron in it, um, and compasses don't actually point towards magnetic north. Uh, in Edinburgh, unless you're unless you're lucky, uh, they're certainly not reliable. We we do have a compass in an aircraft, despite it being a big hunk of metal. Oh, that's not it. It is up here. Hello, I'm on. Pam, pam, pam. Um, so we have a compass. That's a magnetic compass. It does exactly what you would expect a magnetic compass to do, like the little handheld silver type compasses you you use for. Uh, your DOV. But it's not amazing on a big hunk of metal. It's alright. The plane itself doesn't actually use a magnetic compass to generate this. I mean, this is a, a um, obviously a digital screen, um, so it's a little bit different. But it will be using what's called a gyroscopic compass. Um, a gyro is pretty much a spinning mass, a spinning weight, or a spinning wheel. Um, you will probably know a kid's toy, spinning top. When it's spinning, it stays upright. When it stops spinning, it falls over. Um, or if you've seen the film Inception, the little uh, widget toy, which I have actually got one of those, but I've not got it to hand. If you align something to north, and then set it spinning, no matter what you do around it, 
I forgot that was going to happen. My apologies. It will tend to stay pointing in that direction. So as the plane moves around space, that thing that is spinning is still pointing towards north, wherever north may be. It will drift a little bit, but mm, near enough, it will still be pointing where you go. This is how spacecraft um, navigate, because out in space, the magnetic field certainly isn't reliable. Um, so we use gyros, set something spinning. If you know where it was when it started, then you can work out where you are in relation to it and consequently which direction you put in. Don't need to go too deep into the, uh, the trigonometry and all the maths behind that. We, in fact, we won't go into it at all. But you know that if something's spinning, it stays pointing the same way. Obviously, a spinning top stays vertical, but if we had it spinning on its side that way, then it would remain pointing in that horizontal direction, i.e. along your bearing. So a compass is all right if you're in a plane going a long way and you want to fly on a bearing of this and then a bearing of that, it's going to be all right, but the further you go, then the bigger the errors become. If you're out by just a fraction of a degree or the wind is just ever so slightly off what you calculated it to be, which is highly likely, then over time you're going to get further and further away from where you think you are, unless you can offset it. We call it biasing and you can adjust for your error so you know that you're going to fly on a bearing of such and such until you hit Mount Everest, or not hit it, fly over the top of it I would hope. And if you're off by a few miles, well you can see Mount Everest, you can fly towards it, you've reset your error to zero and then you go on your way from there and you keep hopping. So we're using multiple different tools. Um, now, in an airliner where we're going quite a long way and it's going to be dark pretty soon we're not going to have these landmarks we certainly can't rely on them because we're above the cloud okay it's not particularly cloudy today um, over Italy but it could easily be cloudy and we wouldn't be able to see a thing so we need a better way of doing it the obvious one that springs to mind is GPS global positioning system now GPS, in that name, is owned by the American Department of Defense. They allow civilians to use it, but at any time they are well within their rights to just turn it off. Actually what they do, what they would do is encrypt it so that they can still use it, but you can't, you don't know what the data means, so you have no idea. Hey. So it's in law that you are not allowed to rely upon GPS for navigation. You can use it for navigation in an aircraft, I mean, but you can't rely upon it. You always have to have a backup. And this aircraft, this Boeing 787, currently is absolutely using GPS to move along its route here. And if I overlay some terrain, we see we're coming over to land. This is sort of Italy down here, and we're, we're starting to, to come over Italy. Turn off, it's a bit horrible. So, we should have passed Venice by now. Venice is down there. You can sort of make it out. The scenery is not amazing, granted, but take word for it, Venice is down there. And we can see the Alps coming up. We can start seeing some mountains. This is the Alps, so I know roughly I'm in the Alps. The Alps are huge, but we're flying over them from a long way away and we've still got a long way to go. So if I cross the Alps, I know, yeah, I'm pretty much on course. GPS is not the only satellite-based navigation system out there. Your phone, for example, if you use GPS on your phone, we call it GPS, but it's actually now a mix of loads of different systems. So it's not just the Department of Defence one. There's GLONASS, which is the European zone. Uh, there's Baidu, uh, which is the Chinese one. I forget the Russian one. I always forget the name of that one. But there's several others. Some of them are almost open source, so are pretty much guaranteed to work peacetime, wartime, doesn't matter. 
uh, some of them are not but still you are not allowed to rely upon it for your sole form of navigation in an aircraft um, there's no indication that that's going to change anytime soon either wrongly or rightly uh, will not get into the politics GPS is very good at giving you horizontal position so where you are horizontally on a map um, it's in fact it's extremely good at that you can you can get sort of 30 centimeter type accuracy uh, relative um, again we won't go into relative and absolute but you know when we're traveling at several miles a minute it doesn't need to be amazing uh, it just needs to be good enough it's less good at giving you altitude it's not very good at giving you altitude at all actually but again it gives you a rough idea we're only really going to concern ourselves with horizontal position because we get altitude from other sources from air pressure and so on uh, which are much much more accurate and that's just what aircraft use but for horizontal position it's going to say you are here so we can use that we can use it to offset all our biases on the compass so on and so forth and just keep everything updated we know exactly where we are but if that turned off if that stopped working what would we do then so i need to open up a, another little bit of software so just bear with me while i do that we'll flick on that screen again there's a newer version of plan g plan g um, is a bit of free software um, it's really good i absolutely recommend it it works on windows i don't know about other systems there are other tools like this available there's an online one called sky vector uh, if you just google sky vector then um, you, you'll find it it's similar to this very very similar um, but let's sort of take you through this the beauty of this is it will actually integrate with the simulator itself so i can connect to the simulator i will lock us to where we are it's just going a bit slow there we go so this is us we've just passed over venice if i zoom out a smidge you'll you'll be able to see that and this is providing us effectively a gps map of where we are um, it knows exactly where we are gps would give us that um, but obviously through the wonders of computers it can it can skip a few goes so if gps died now you'll notice we've got loads of bits of information on this graph and i'm just going to declutter it ever so slightly if i can find the button i'm looking for it's not under there it's under here we're going to get rid of that one that one that one that one that one that one in fact we're going to get rid of all of them we don't need any of them so right that's slightly better these circles i hope, I hope you can just about make out the mouse pointer um but let's zoom in on one here this is vicenza uh, probably butchered the pronunciation of that and there's actually two symbols here now annoyingly if I zoom in on that it's going to stay the same size isn't it one of them's a circle with a dot in the middle and the other one that you can't see behind there is a hexagon um, in this case the hexagon has got a square around it as well now the circle this green circle here doesn't necessarily have to be green but uh, it, it's a circle with a dot in it is a non-directional beacon an NDB now an NDB is exactly what it says on the tin it's a beacon that doesn't give you any directional information let me just see if I can find a, a better picture for you here we go NDB so yeah, that's a bit of a high detail thing but it's a circle with a dot is is what it is that's what it looks like in real life pretty simple bit of radio normally good for 100 mile <coughs> excuse me 100 miles or so um but the, it does vary quite significantly hmm. there we go um and in the aircraft what does it tell you well 
And let's see, are we still going to be in range of that? Yeah, probably. So this MDB is on four. 417 kilohertz oh it's got a range of 75 miles that's probably oh it is good enough uh, let's jump into the aircraft and let's key that in so we want to be on it's not on HF it's on page 2 I'm going to hold my head at a funny angle so I can find it uh, 400 uh, the one 417 kilohertz does it want the decimal as well probably ah oh, stop being an annoying aircraft I don't normally fly Boeing so this is a very good reason why clear damn you right okay we won't do that Effectively, what you'll get, we'll do this in more depth in, a, in, in an aircraft that's really geared up to doing this type of navigation, airliners, not so much. You will basically get a little arrow and it will just point towards the beacon. So it says the beacon's over there. So you do get a bearing to it, but you, you don't get any more. You don't get distance, so you don't know how far away you are from it. If you're directly overhead, you won't get anything at all and as you fly over the top then the pointer will spin and face the other way so it's just always pointing towards it think of it like the north needle on a compass the difference is it does an NDB um, doesn't point north it points towards the beacon very very simple um, but you can you can use them as a crude rough form of navigation so we could have flown from Venice say and we'll always keep the the beacon to our you know four o'clock is that roughly so around about 110 degrees and as long as it's always pointing 110 degrees we're roughly gonna get sort of close to Vicenza but as we get closer we can then fly straight to it and then from there we can maybe fly down to whatever this is. I'm not even going to attempt to butcher more Italian names. Down to this one and then back in towards Venice. So, you know, you can use them to hop from place to place. Problem happens, for example, over the Alps. There are no NDBs. We could not use that to fly across the Alps. The range of this one probably... I was going to point to the screen there, you can't see it. We're probably on the edge of its range here, and we wouldn't be in range of the next one over there. Now, you could use what's called dead reckoning. So, you sort of know where you were when you lost the range. You fly on a compass bearing until you pick this one up. There's going to be a good amount of error, but you are certainly going to hit it unless you're not flying in circles, which is reasonably hard to do anyway. So, you could actually use it to hop the Alps but not for any sort of accurate navigation within a few miles um, of where you want to be. The other one are the VORs, uh, VHF, VHF Omnidirectional, it's not radar, I don't think, uh, VOR, Omnidirectional Range, that's it. A VOR looks very different. Come on, Wiki. You can see there's a lot more going on here in terms of the antenna itself. Loads of stuff going on. All these little things round in a circle. And I do believe there's another good picture. Is there another top-down picture? No, there isn't. Come in different forms and different shapes and sizes and so on. Um, but they do give you directional information. Some of them will give you range, distance as well. A VOR that just gives you direction. Oh, shut up. There we go. Mute. Is just a hexagon. Normally with a dot in the middle. Not always. If it has distance as well, it will have a square around it. And a Vortac, that's a military thing, we'll talk about that later. 
it works in a very different way. The needle doesn't just point towards the beacon. In fact, it doesn't point towards the beacon at all. What it does, or let's not talk about what it does, let's talk about how you use it, and then it should become a little bit more apparent. On here, I can show a radial, and let's say we're going to do an inbound radial of 090 for a distance of 100 miles. Ping. That's now put a line on here, I hope you can just about see that, an inbound radial of 090. What we can do is we can tune into the frequency of this VOR. We can then set our instrument to 090, and that will allow us to follow this line. Follow it. Really, really good stuff. So if we weren't on the line, but we wanted to intercept it, so let's pick another radial. I'm going to go for an outbound of, I'm going to have to get this right now, 290, something like that. Oh, perfect. So we're flying up here now. We actually want to be on this line. If we keyed in this frequency and a radial of 290 degrees, then we would know, the instrument would tell us when we cross this line. And at that point, we can then turn left a bit onto roughly 290, which will put us roughly on the line, and the instrument would tell us how far left or how far right of the line we are. So we can then adjust and get absolutely slap bang on this line. Once we've gone along this a little bit, we may want to switch over to whatever this one is, over here say, no, it's not going to show me, it's going to be a pain. And then we want to fly inbound to that VOR on roughly a radial of 100. Oh, hang on. Sorry, did inbound, didn't I? Inbound, add 180, so 280. Pating. So we fly along this one. We use our second radio to tune into this frequency on a radial of 280. And when we cross this line, then we just flick over to follow that one. And we can completely ignore this first one. We're past it now, we don't care. On that first radio, we can then tune into the next one. Let's say this one on a uh, an inbound radial of... So, I'm not going to do inbound because it confuses me. Uh, let's say that's around about 130-ish maybe. Yeah, so we fly outbound along here until we pick up this radial. Then we turn, follow this line, ignore that one, and so on and so forth. You get the idea now, hopefully. So this gives us a precise form of navigation. We can now actually follow a line we've plotted on a map, and we can follow it rather than just hopping from one known point to the next in some sort of willy-nilly fashion on a rough compass heading, but you're not necessarily going that way because the wind could be pushing you, inaccuracies in your compass and so on and so forth. So hopefully from this you've got a little bit of an idea now that there are options available to us. There are things we can do to be able to navigate in the air. We don't know how to do it yet, but you've got a bit of an idea. Let me just drop this sensor screen. In fact, no, let's go back to Plan G. So, where else is this also quite useful? Well, if we zoom into London, I don't know which runway I'm going to be on yet, but probably going to be 26, sorry, 27 left. So let's just really slow to zoom in, but as it declutters, it gets a bit better. Right, so here's Heathrow. Uh, so we're likely to be coming in this way, on this runway. Uh, all depends on the wind when we get there, so on and so forth. We'll do this. These big green lines, or cones, what are they showing? Well... We've got a VOR here, so we can actually get into London. So we could fly into London, let's say on a radial of 
Mm. 100. Whoop, hello. Hello. There we go. So let's say we're flying in on this radial from uh, wherever that is. Manston. Ah, oh, there we go. You've done a camp to Manston. And we can fly in along this line and we know it's going to take us straight into Heathrow. But what we can also do is use what is at the point of these green lines. It's effectively a VOR. But it's a very, very precise, highly accurate VOR that we call a localizer. And the localizer isn't 360 degrees. We can't pick it up from anywhere. We can actually only pick it up in this cone. If we're outside of that cone, we won't see it at all. You can tune into the frequency, but you ain't going to see it. But once we get into this cone, we will pick it up. And I don't think this is going to let me do it. But if you imagine a line being drawn along here, coming out east to west, actually along the centre line of the runway, we call it an extended centre line, we could pick up that radial, that extended centre line, and follow it. And if we follow that line, we know that we are on the centre line of the runway. So if we're also descending, and getting closer and closer to the airport, it's going to give us a straight line, straight into the middle of the runway, and therefore we can land. Now, you would still need visual to be able to land using a localizer because you don't necessarily know how far away you are and you certainly don't know how high you are. You know roughly how high you are from the air pressure and so on but you don't actually know exactly what the air pressure is at that exact moment on the ground. So you, you don't know whether you're slightly high or slightly low. So you still need a visual to actually be able to touch down softly rather than either hit the deck really hard or flare when you're still 100 feet, stall and then hit the ground really, really hard. You will still land, but it will be what's called a bad landing. Difference between a good landing and a bad landing. A good landing, you can use the aircraft again afterwards. It's not in bits. And you've probably survived. Every aircraft will land, but it depends whether it was a good one or a bad one as to whether you can use that plane again or whether anyone walked away. What goes up must go down and all that. Anyway, enough of the uh, sick humour. So we can, we can now fly in to the centre line of the runway using this localizer, a very precise, highly accurate VOR. And we'll be using that today to fly into Heathrow. There's also, a, so a localizer is working horizontally. A VOR, an NDB, they're all working horizontally. They don't give you any vertical. They don't give you your height or your, you know, your, your glide slope, as it were. But if we had one and turned it on its side, it's then operating vertically. This is called, well, funnily enough, a glide slope. Um, now, a glide slope is just an angle, but when we're talking about the radio stuff, um, it's also called a glide slope, which is a little bit confusing. But it's basically a, a, a localizer that's been put on its side. Technically, it's actually quite a bit different to that, but in practice, that's exactly what it's doing. It will also only work within this green cone. And what it does is it will tell you whether you're this side of the line or that side of the line. Now, it's not left or right anymore. It's high or low, but it's working in exactly the same way. These are fixed. So... There's no tuning in the exact heading of the runway. Don't need to do any of that. These are fixed. And for Heathrow, it's fixed at three degrees. So the angle to the ground... Oh, hello, I'm looking at the screen capture. There we go. This angle here is three degrees. That is your typical glide slope into a typical airport. There are others, but pretty much all of them are all three degrees. 
one of the key other ones actually if you're interested is here is london city airport it's five and a half degrees still doesn't sound a lot we'll do a flight into london city at some point and you will see oh it's it's a bit twitchy because you're coming in really really steep those extra two and a half degrees makes a huge difference to what it looks like it looks like you're about to lawn dart into the ground the reason it's so steep is because there's buildings either side of the runway and you've got the Millennium Dome down here or whatever it's called now, uh, O2 Arena or something, I don't know. Uh, you've got the Shard, you've got all the big buildings here in London uh, and there's some um, dockyard type stuff out here as well, some big buildings. So it has to be steep otherwise you, you can't physically get in. Now that also limits the type of aircraft that can get in. This aircraft, the Boeing 787, 787-800 to be precise, this is absolutely not capable of doing a 5 degree glide slope. It will just accelerate, you will not slow down. 3 degrees, more than happy with that, and that's exactly what we'll be doing in smooth flight. Well, that's a nice view, didn't mean to do that though. When you combine a localizer, and a glide slope. So now we know exactly where we are on the center line. We know exactly where we are on this three degree slope at to the start of the runway. We call this an ILS, an instrument landing system. It's a system because it comprises of more than one thing. The aircraft can fly along that line. So we've got a horizontal and we've got a vertical line. So therefore we have an exact line in space taking us right into the centre and start of the runway, exactly where we want to be. Now if this is accurate enough, i.e. the radio is accurate enough, and the aircraft is capable of flying accurate enough and receiving the signal in an accurate way, then we can do a full Category 3 landing. And a full Category 3 landing, don't worry too much about the terminology, is where the aircraft will fly and put its wheels on the ground. The pilot does not have to have seen the runway or the ground or anything at all. So you could be in thick fog and the aircraft will safely put itself onto the runway exactly where you want it to be. There's also Category 1 and Category 2. We won't go too much into depth, but effectively what that means is you're allowed to fly on the, the ILS, but there'll be a minimum height. And if you, say, are at 200 feet and you still can't see the runway, you have to abort the landing and take back off, go somewhere else or try again, depending on what the weather's doing or the reason for why you couldn't see the runway. Category 1, very, very similar, except the minimum altitude, called minimums, will be considerably higher. Let's say a 1,000 feet. Depends completely on the airfield. Absolutely on the airfield. You can also not use the autopilot. You can actually just get the raw signal and have it plot it on an instrument in the cockpit and then you can hand fly it and try and maintain yourself on this imaginary line without actually ever looking out of the window if you have an instrument rating which is like a driving test um, but it's the pilot pi private pilot's license it's the next one up it's the one that allows you to fly only on instruments with no visibility you would be able to hand fly it in, but you would not be able to do a category three, i.e. full wheels down, because that has to be on an autopilot by definition. We're gonna do all of this, D don't worry. We're just skimming over the high level at the moment. So that's roughly what's going on. Oh no, killed the wrong one. I killed me, oh, I'm back again. So we're currently, where are we? Uh, let's have a look, see at the map. We're just coming out of Switzerland. Uh, we've just passed over Zurich. 
So let's have a quick look, see if we can see Zurich, which should be roughly... Ah, uh, see, there you go. There's a very good example of why using landmarks when you're at 38,000 feet is completely NFG, no flipping good, because it's cloudy. Can't see it. Zurich is down there somewhere behind this cloud. But you can start seeing some of the roads, and you can see motorways. So actually, it's not bad when the scenery decides to load FSX is unfortunately 32 bits so there's a limited amount of scenery it can have loaded at any one time um, so the draw distance is quite far in and each one of these lights is an object and it can only be 32 bits worth uh, but anyway it gets better the lower we get so as we start getting towards Blighty towards Heathrow there you go, because it's trying to load too much scenery in, now it can't load the cockpit, it'll catch up. I'm going to pause the video here, it'll be a momentary pause for you guys, it'll be probably another hour, maybe an hour and a quarter for me, until we start getting a little bit closer towards Landon Town, um, and we will do the instrument approach, and you will see on this lovely lovely digital screen it's called a glass cockpit you'll see on this screen what the instruments are doing and therefore what the aircraft is doing to fly precisely so I'll catch you in a few moments right change my mind <laughs> this is about a minute later let's just talk about the charts and let's, let's go through the approach and then it's not so much of a rush later here is the approach we're going to do. In fact, tell you what, before we do that, let's just have a look at the route. Ignore this red line going off there. Um, this system's just had a bit of a wobble. But we're going in Rotno, Etvax, Tiger. You might not be able to see that, depending on how YouTube uh, renders this. Into Weald, and then this is London here. So we're going to fly... The Alesso One Hotel Star, Star Standard Terminal Arrival Route. So, Rotno, Advax Tiger, his uh, wield is here, it's also big in. Um, you will recognise the symbol in there if you can see it. Oh, I can't quite zoom in enough, that's annoying, but it's a hexagon with a dot in the middle and it's got a square around it as well. This is a VOR. Now, this is going to really throw you now, so apologies. London have moved most of their arrivals to what's called RNAV, which is radio navigation, most of which use GPS coordinates as their waypoints. So these little stars here, these aren't radio navigation things. These are all... Um, GPS coordinates or defined as GPS coordinates so for to fly this approach you have to have GPS or one of its derivatives not derivatives one of its competitors if that's the word GLONASS but I do whatever everything gets lumped in as one now and everyone just calls it GPS technically it's called GNSS Global Nav Navigation Satellite System but it doesn't roll off the tongue everyone calls it GPS so anyway, we'll be flying this route on GPS. We could technically fly it on a VOR radial of 316. Um, and because we have distance, we'd be flying this 316 radial up to... Uh, what's that? So that's 20... 35 miles. And when we're um, further away than 35 miles, then we would be on a radial of 315 degrees. So you can actually fly it without GPS, which is how this is okay to do. Um, but it's a bit of a pain in the butt, um, and you just use GPS. But you have your VORs all keyed in, tuned in, so if it died, at, you know, it's always going to happen at the worst moment, then you can just flick over to using the radio it's just a little bit more pilot work to do. Um, in an airliner like this, it's actually no pilot work. The computer does it for you, the flight computer. Um, 
but but it's perfectly you know doable. Anyway, we'll be flying into Biggin Hill. From there, you would then get radar vectors. Radar vectors is where air traffic control tells you where to go. So they will basically just give you compass bearings and you will fly on those bearings uh, until told otherwise. We're flying offline, so we're not going to have air traffic control. So I'm just going to manually use the moving map to vector myself, to give myself bearings and get us on an approach onto runway 27 here. So if we look at runway 27, here we can see this cone that was green on plan G. This is black and white, whatever. We get the frequency and we get the bearing. We'll be keying this in. In fact, actually, the computer will be doing it for us. But when we come on to not an airliner, um, we will see how to do this um, manually. Here you can see this dotted circle. That's an NDB, non-directional uh, beacon. Frequency is 316 kilohertz. These are in megahertz, by the way, so there's quite a frequency difference between the two. Um, so this would be used for non-precision um, navigation. And this is where, you, if you miss your approach, you don't land for whatever reason, then you turn out. You fly on a radial of 147 from Chiltern, which is off the map here, until you hit Epsom. And then you just keep flying in circles until you're told to do something else around Epsom, um, told by air traffic control. Hopefully we won't need to do a go around. I've not flown the 787 for a long, long time, and I don't particularly like flying Boeings either. Um, I'm not particularly good at it, so it may well happen, we'll see. All being well, we'll, we'll be down first go. So we'll be flying ourselves in, radar vectors, or uh, manual vectors, until we hit this radial coming off 270 on this center line and we will be flying straight in. If we scroll down we see what the, um, the, the vertical plan looks like. This is that three degree glide slope as you can see descent angle there ILS glide slope three degrees so it's a standard um, and we will intercept that at 2,500 feet. So we will fly all the way down to 2,500 feet on pressure altitude until we hit the glide slope and then we will des um, descend with the glide. If we're doing a category 3 landing and there's 3A and 3B, don't worry too much about that. But if we're doing a 3A, the decision height is 50 feet. So if we get to 50 feet and we've seen the runway, then we can land visually. If we haven't seen the runway, we would have to go around if we are doing category 3A. If we have a radar in the aircraft, a radar that is pointing downwards, that is measuring your distance to the ground, um, then that doesn't actually, uh, then, then it would be 50 feet, sorry. DA is what I just described, but is when you're on pressure. That's your decision altitude. So if we are on pressure altitude, then our decision is at 177 feet. That is what the instrument on the aircraft will be saying. If we've not seen the ground at 177 feet and we're doing a Cat 2 landing, then we have to go around. If we have the radar pointing down, gives you an accurate distance to the ground, then we can reduce that to 100 feet. I hope that is slightly clearer than very dirty mud now. Category 3, you only have a decision height, so you cannot do this on pressure alone. You have to have a radar height. And Category 3B is what we mentioned a few moments ago where the aircraft will actually put its wheels onto the floor and you don't have to have seen the ground at all. RVR, runway visual range, so uh, this is dependent on the type of aircraft you're in. Actually at Heathrow it doesn't matter. Category D is the heaviest, C is next, so on and so forth. A and B, Heathrow just doesn't handle aircraft that light, uh, it just doesn't care. So it's not uh, it's not it's not mentioned on here. 
If the glide slope is out, i.e. the radio that does glide slope isn't working at all, so we only have the localizer, we can't do a category one, we can't do a category two, or category three, A or B. We can only do a localizer approach, so we have no guidance on our three degree glide, but we know exactly where the sensor line is. In that case, our decision height above the ground is 563 feet. So you can see that's considerably higher up. If we're doing it on pressure, air pressure, then it's 640. And we have to have a visual uh, clarity, so the fog, if there was fog, we have to be able to see roughly two kilometers. If it's worse than that, then we just cannot do this. There is not an, there is not an option. Don't worry about the circle to land. We're not doing that. No one does that at Heathrow anyway. Um, cool. So this gives us our approach. Hope that makes sense. Um, there are some other little aids. There's markers, middle markers, outer markers and inner markers. Uh, I'll turn those on. Don't normally have those on, but I'll turn them on. We'll talk about those when they hit. Just for reference, these Ds, that's distance in miles. Uh, it's your DME, DME range. DME, distance measuring equipment. That is what the square is around a VOR. So if we go back to this, we have a hexagon. That's a VOR. A hexagon with a square around it is a DME. If you just have a square with no hexagon, it's just a DME. It's not giving you any heading, but it will tell you exactly how far away from it you are. So this is DME distance, that's one mile from the start of the runway or from, from our touchdown point. In fact, no, this is start of the runway here. You can see it's defined. D0 is, is at the start of the runway. Um, and so on, out to seven and a half miles. We can then look at this on the glide slope. And we can see four miles, we should be at 1,410 feet. At one mile, we should be at 450 feet and so on and so forth. Hope that makes sense. This time, I will be back in a few moments and we'll be a little bit closer to our descent. Alrighty, so welcome back. We have just started our descent. We're still pretty high. Still pretty high over France. Um, but oh, I thought you might be interested just to see some of the, uh, you know, some of the procedures and whatnot that we do in the aircraft. Excuse me, panning around. So this is our EFB electronic flight bag. Um, keyed in category three just because we can. Uh, flat thirty landing two seven left. Runway currently is dry. Uh, winds at Heathrow are two zero zero ten knots. So that's where the wind's coming from. Outside air temperature is currently a lovely 12 degrees at Heathrow. QNH 1024, so that's the air pressure. Uh, so that's 1.024 bar. Um, and sea ice, we don't need that. We're above 10 degrees. Reverse is no credit, that's fine. Auto spoilers. Auto brake one. Technically, we don't actually need auto brakes at all. So I'm just going to pull that to the no, I don't want max manual. Yeah, auto rate one will be fine. Uh, our weight will be. That's a good question. Uh, blah, 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 blah. What we're looking for? CDU. I uh, want. Oh, that one. In it breath. In it breath, please. Thank you. Index. Performance. So zero fuel weight, so the weight of the aircraft plus passengers, baggage, all the rest of it, without fuel, 261.8 pounds, because I forgot to change it into kilos, and you've got to do it at the start. So 261.8, and our estimated fuel on landing is going to be, uh, if I can find the right page, 173.4, 173.4, giving us a landing weight of 523.6 pounds, 1,000 pounds. 
so we're actually going to be really heavy. 6.7 to be precise. So in that goes, calculate. So that tells us, uh, I've added five knots to our VREF, so that's our approach speed. Uh, VREF plus five is going to be 160 knots when we've got 30 degrees of flat. Uh, auto brake 1, it will take 8,722 8, feet to stop. Let me just leave them on that point. Whoa, hello. Uh, so this tells you, depending on how hard you're putting the brakes on, how long it will take you to stop. Uh, and quite nicely, it tells you how long the runway is. Uh, that's assuming you touch down at the start of the uh, touchdown point. And I'm probably going to float it. Either way, we've got loads of space. It's actually fine. So I can send that output, what we've just calculated, let me just sort the zooms out. So I can send that output, I don't even see what it is, to the main flight computer. This is just a, a, a tablet, it's not really connected to anything. Uh, and I don't think I need to accept that, so that's fine. So our arrival into Heathrow, we've already mentioned we'll be do doing the ILS 2.7. And we're going to be doing the Alesso One Hotel approach. Um, <laughs> and we won't be doing any transition because uh, I'm going to do manual vectors. So if we go to the route now, and go to plan on here, uh, we can step. Oh, see now I've got to remember how you do this on the flipping Boeing. This is very easy to do. Map censoring. No. Not destination, that'll do. Right, big in, big into our final fix. So we want to do a direct there. So if I go to route, don't worry if this makes absolutely no sense to you. It makes no sense to me. Oh, you suck. I didn't mean to do that. Do I undo? No, I don't want to execute. Ah. Oh. Okay, the race. Right. Uh, so I want to get rid of this. Flip the you do it in a Boeing. Arg. So complicated. I don't want any of that nonsense. If in doubt, button bash until it does what you want it to do. Oh, there we go. That's what I did before and it didn't let it work. Oh, whatever. Um, it seems to be missing a load of waypoints there. Well, that's for some reason erased my final fix. I think I need to do that actually. Let's just get rid of these warnings if in doubt, ignore it. Um, so, anyway, coming out of Biggin, we will fly a radial, I uh, don't know, hold your head at the right angle of uh, 320, 330 maybe degrees out of there, onto the ILS anyway, so I'm not. Not that bothered. He throws an easy one to come into, to be honest. Um, now, whether FSX handles all the scenery is another point altogether. So we're descending down to flight level 180. Uh, we need to be at 180 by big in. Or do we? Again. Nothing blooming remember how to do this in a Boeing. That's definitely not it. Oh, there we go, that's what I'm looking for. Big in flight. Ah, oh, right, okay, so it's already, it already knows the altitudes that we need to be at or above or below or whatever and, and where. So I don't need to worry too much about that because the, the flight computer will calculate the best descent path. 
which it seems to have recalculated. Oh, because I've deleted some of the plan. So it's going to follow this line. Because we're below it, it won't climb us back up. It'll just wait until we're, we're back on it. Uh, that's all virtual. There's nothing to do with radios or anything on, on that. Uh, I'll zoom in a bit so we can see what's going on. Uh, I'm just going to declutter this a smidge. Uh, that's not what I want though. Do I get rid of all these waypoints? There we go. I uh, don't need that one to be honest. Stations, we don't want that. Yeah, cool, that's fine. That's, that's sort of decluttered enough. Let's just zoom out. There we go. We can see big in on there now. Uh, if we put terrain on, we should be able to see some sea. I promised you the White Cliffs of Dover. We might just catch a glimpse of them. We're still sort of over France at the moment. Uh, let me show you. And yeah, sorry if my little image of me has moved. I managed to mess up my webcam. I was trying to get you a uh, joystick cam, but for some reason OBS just refuses to uh, have two webcams on at once. So here we are. Come on. You can do it. You can do it, computer. Uh, I've also increased the gamma as well on the screen capture because... Uh, Otherwise, you're not going to see anything. So that's it with the with it set, the gamma set properly. Looks a little bit dark to you, uh, and that's how I've brightened it up for you guys. It's just not on. I've just not done it for all the screens. Right, that's annoying me. That can go away. Let's do it a different way. There we go. Right. So we've just we're we're over the English Channel at the moment. White Cliffs are Dover, around there somewhere. Oh, by Sandy, funnily enough. Uh, so here we are coming in. Lovely job, Luke. Right, let's get rid of that nonsense. I'm going to let the aircraft do its thing, really, until I have to intervene to do the vectors. Um, so I don't need to key in any of the uh, radio stuff. It'll do all that for me. So we can just concentrate on what it looks like to the pilot, how we use it, and so on and so forth. So we're down, down to flight level 180. In fact, I can knock this all the way down to 7,500 feet, which is what we want to be at at big in. Uh, and that will take us all the way down. Now, we need to be at flight level 180 at that. Epvax. Is it Epvax? Yeah. Anyway, yeah, it is Epvax, sorry. Uh, they, they just give them names. Um, so we, we can't be lower than that at that point anyway, and then from there it's calculated a bit of a wibbly wobbly descent down into Biggin. Oh, Biggin 7000, not 7500. That's why your chair can have a look. And then from there, we'll vector sort of north-ish, descend all the way down to 2,500 feet, uh, which is our ILS intercept altitude. Um, and then uh, when we pick up the ILS, so the localizer and the glide slope, we'll be able to see what that looks like on the screen. Um, I'll, move, I'll change off the moving map at that point, uh, and we will just use the ND, uh, which is clutching. Why is it not giving me my ND? Oh, because that is the ND. Uh, 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 so that's not what I want, is it? Ah, oh, why are Boeing so difficult? I want to change that, so it's the big version of that. Don't want to press that button. No, right, can't do it, too difficult. Uh, 
Uh, it's definitely not on there. I'm button bashing now because I can't figure out how to do what I want to do. Just button bash a bit more then, shall we? No, 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 I don't want to do any of that. Um, right, okay, never mind. Uh, systems are fine. Auto brakes set. Uh, yeah, altimeters will do that when we get a bit lower. Cool, alright, so we're progressing nicely. Slowly, slowly, catchy monkey. I'll see you a big in. Well, I promised you the White Cliffs of Dover, but um, in typical British fashion, you ain't going to see them. Because it's cloudy. Yay. But we're starting to get some scenery. Now we're a bit lower down. Um, so we're starting to see some features that, you know, you would see obviously better on the, in real life. Um, not hugely. I mean, obviously you're getting good contrast on some of this stuff. Uh, obviously the gamma looks a bit weird. It's very bright on your screen. Um, should really look like that. But uh, we'll turn the gamma up because the cockpit looks rubbish otherwise. Um, so here we are. We're descending towards London Town. <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. Chug, chug, chug. Come on, you can do it. You can do it, computer. Oh yeah, okay. So, flight level one two zero. Um, getting quite close to begin. Um, I wanted to just come in uh, a little bit earlier than planned uh, before we get to Biggin Hill, because. Uh, there's a couple of things we have to do when we hit uh, flight level 100 and you know you might be interested this is um, you know what you do in airliners if you don't care skip forwards uh, five five minutes or so um, in fact I can see exactly but I can't uh, speed brakes required no we're all right so at the moment Right, here we go, coming up to flight level 100. So, flight level 100, lights come on. That's it. That's all, that's all we have to do. And that puts the landing lights on, which you can't see because it's not rendered that either. Oh, FSX. Look at the bend on the wing. There we go, so we can see the, uh, the landing lights on here. See, look at the bend on the wings. Approach the checklist altimeters are currently set to standard pressure, which is 1013 millibars or hectopascals if you prefer. When we get down to 7000, we'll fly level 70, then we will flick over to local QH. Which is, I keyed it in on here, 1024. And you'll watch our altitude change, but we don't actually move. So that's where we're setting what the pressure is at the airfield. So we're actually on course for the descent, so I don't know why it was moaning about speed brakes. We're absolutely fine. Um, oh, because we're going a little bit quick. So flight level 100 and below, we should be less than 250 knots. So let's just pull the speed brake lead right. You might hear the of the rumble, and that's, oh, come on. And that's because we got these speed brakes out like that. Just adds a bit of drag. Thousand to go. That's what the, the pong was. Uh, and I'm going to set us up on a heading of around 310, I think, should get us there or thereabouts. So 310 out of big in. Right, so now I need to check that because I've done an intervene that we're actually doing... Or not then. Oh no, no, I'm clicking the wrong button. Navrad, there we go. 
Uh, so it's got the VOR in at the moment. So how do I put the ILS in? Oh, it's got ILS already in. 109.5 on a radial of 270. Oh, and it's even plotted us. Oh, look at this. Oh, maybe I will fall in love with Boeing's. Uh, it's even plotted us our extended centre line here. But we'll get that from the radio anyway. So I'm going to drop us down a bit further. Uh, 4,000 should do us for now. Descend please, thank you kindly. And then I can just zoom in a smidge on the other way. So I'm like, there we go, lovely. Have we slowed down a bit yet? Yeah. We're getting there, we're getting there. Uh, I'm going to put in put in ba, 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 ba. oh no I can't because I'm on Vino I would very much like the aircraft to slow down a bit so I can put some flaps down uh, let's turn all the nice lights on, shall we? Uh, do I need to do anything up here? No, I don't. Thousand feet to go. Let's see why it's dropping like a blooming brick at the moment. No, oh, we're only one and a half thousand. And the visibility sucks. So we may be on Cat 3 after all. I'm going to arm approach on the autopilot. So that tells the autopilot that we're going to be coming onto an ILS fairly soon. Oh, it's picked up already. Fantastic. So, what we can see here pink diamond, pink diamond. This bottom one is the localizer. Currently, the line that we want to be on, the centre line of the runway, is to the left of us. The glide slope is currently below us, which is a bit of a concern. So down we go to 2500. Come on, is it press it? Yep, down we go. Speed is coming back, so I'm going to drop a notch of flaps. So the glide slope is below us, the centre line is to the left of us. The aircraft will now try and pick up both of those, so you can see we're turning left ever so slightly. Bleed some of this speed off, man. It's alright, we'll be fine. Dump some more speed brake. Clyde slope is still slightly below us, so we'll just go down a smidge further. Oh, and I can even put the head up display on. Center that. Sorry, just as I save that position. Lovely days. 2500 is checked. Oops. Uh, put some more flaps down and gear can come down. Altimeters should absolutely be on 1024 by now, but they're not because I'm an idiot. This is not a lesson on how to fly well, as you probably gathered. Oh yeah, please be seated for arrival, lovely. 1024. You know what, I'm probably going to go manual. So you can see we're on the centre line, the pink diamond tells us that we are bang on the line we want to be, and the pink diamond tells us that our glide slope is good as well. Flaps 20. That flaps 25 will do. Land 3. Land 3. Oh, hello. No, not that much. And we'll bring our speed down to V-Ref. Feet on pedals. I'm going to need them in a moment. 
Can we see the runway yet? No, not yet. Why not? Oh, we passed it. What? Okay, something has gone very weird with the scenery here. So, go around. Engine spinning up. And the knock, some storm auto throttle. That's who what to do. Alright, so gear up. Bring the flaps up a notch and we'll do a go around. Brilliant. Just what I wanted. There's the gear up. And we'll just do a manual fly go around here. So, yeah, due to the unique way that FSX works, and um, I'm convinced that was an FSX issue, um, it had put where the radio is clearly in the wrong place. That's weird, I've not had that happen here before. I'll have to check that out because uh, I'm using payware scenery. Um, it may well, may well have confused it. Although I don't see why it would, because it's never done it before. But uh, anyway, uh, 200 knots will be plenty. Let's get myself trimmed a smidge, and we'll give that another go. So 2,500. That's good. So we're being the runway at the moment. Just nudging out a smidge just to give us a bit more room for the base turn. Uh, we've got a warning that autopilot is disconnected. Yeah, because you did the wrong thing, you stupid thing. Uh, flaps 15 is fine. Just so much for good weather here in London. So around we go. Looking for a heading of 090, which is parallel the runway. So I'm purely flying this by hand at the moment, there's no autopilot, there's a runway there, so we'll fly out for about four, four or five miles. Turn base, turn final, uh, and then we'll be, then we'll be golden. I can't see any of these numbers, there's no chance you guys can. Oh, there we go. Just overshot 090 slightly. That's in so 1025, that's slightly high. 1024. There we go. So we're actually a smidge high, that's good. That's where I want to be, really. We can pull our speed back now. So speed coming back. Thankfully, we've got absolutely bags of fuel. Turn off lights and come on. Let's have a look and see what we look like from outside. Yes, very nice. All the lights on. Does look good for this aircraft. Uh, in fact, I can make it look even better by doing that. Oh, and you can see the cabin lights in as well. Oh, yeah. Full on nerd rage here. Not nerd rage the uh, YouTube stream. Up yet, but. So as you can see, this is reasonably easy to fly. You know, no hands. It would be if I could trim it properly. There we go. Look at that. Oh, we just changed speed. That's why the trim went. So 
flaps 20, one that before we start the turn, you don't really want to be putting flaps down as you're turning, it can uh, really catch you out. Just go out a couple more miles, be nice if it actually told us how far we are. Uh, I suppose what I need to do is... Oh, it's just got us on the missed approach, so that's not particularly helpful. Alright, base turn. You can see the glide slope, we have picked it up, and it is above us at the moment, so we don't want to descend any more than we are doing. So let's just keep that nose up. Spin round to north. You can see the runway here on the moving map, so we ain't going to see it out the window. Max wings level, so flap 25 please, thank you kindly, gear down, it's about north, just a bit past, there's the gear coming down, nice, I say the lighting does look superb on this aircraft. And we can bring ourselves all the way down to our VREF, which was 160 knots. Yeah, 160 knots. You see the diamond has started to move, so that means we're getting close to that centre line, so I'm going to anticipate that and start turning in. don't particularly want to descend much more. Flat full. Oh, I just did that on the joystick button. And then. Now I can't see the runway here, and I'm very cautious about that radio being wrong. Now I'm happy with the sensor line. The sensor line was good, it was the blind slope. Ah, oh, right, okay, I can see the runways now. And I just see them coming into the HUD, head up display. Right, so we're actually uh, ready to land very early here. So I'm going to arm the speed brakes. Kadoink. So they will deploy automatically once the uh, aircraft detects weight on the wheels. I.e. we've touched down. And I'm going to go ahead and say we are clear for land. So, landing checklist, gear is down, and flaps are 30 degrees. I've just lost the runway again, there it is. I'm happy with the set too. Landing right? checklist. This head up display is incredibly irritating. Oh yeah, we're all right. See, flying by the radio is uh, is good. See, the glide slope's picked up quite well there. No, that's really off-putting. No, I don't want that. Now you will see what's called the Pappy lights. Those four lights. Can't quite see those four there. We want two white, two red. Two white, two red means we're bang on the glide slope. Four white means you're too high. And four red means you're dead. You're too low. So I'm pretty much flying this off instruments at the moment. Just looking oh, at these wow. two diamonds, it, it might not render very well on YouTube. But uh, don't worry, we'll be talking about that a little bit more in depth in another video. As I say, this is just a, a wet the appetite and talk about some of the high level stuff. Okay, I'm going to completely disregard the instruments now. And we're on, uh, we've got good visuals, so I'm just going to fly in visual. Still flying by hand as well is why we're rocking about all over the place. We're good on height though. In fact we're bang on. Too red, too white. 500 feet is checked. Check. So when the wheels touch down, I'll be pulling the throttle back and going into reverse thrust.
continued. Say what? Considering I've not flown this plane in well over a year, probably two. One hundred. No, I've floated the land in a bit, and now the scenery's gone to pot. So retard. Kick the rudder. Oh, there we go. God, that was a floater, so to speak. So, reverse is a green. So, the aircraft's just doing its thing. It's put the spoilers up. You can see the engines are in reverse. Stow the reverses now. Yeah, this scenery's gone completely delally, hasn't it? And we'll take the high speed exit here. Ladies and gentlemen, we will be taxiing for the next few minutes, so please remain seated with your seatbelt fastened until the captain turns off the fastened seatbelt sign. The scenery will catch up. At that time, please remember to check around your seating area, in the seat pockets, and overhead bins for all personal belongings that you brought on board. Please take care when opening the overhead bins, as the contents may have shifted during flight. So, flaps up. Spoilers are away. Auto brake is disarmed. Landing lights and strobe lights are now off. Taxi light is on. Transponder can go to TA, which is receive only. We'll take taxiway alpha. Not that you can see because the scenery has just gone completely nuts. Well, yeah, I do apologise about that. I might just turn your gamma down. Thanks. I think it's a smidge high. Uh, let's see if we can do that wall tax here. So we rest through the disaster. Uh, not that button, not that button. Filters, that's what I want. Gamma, just nudge that down a bit. Yeah, that's a little bit better. And we're taxiing on Alpha into Terminal 5, which is British Airways Terminal. Uh, we can turn the auto brake off, no we don't need that. Getting a full on Ryanair taxi here, going nice and quick, so let's just dab the brakes a smidge. Just bring that speed down, shouldn't taxi faster than 50, uh, 20 knots. And this thing was struggling to taxi at Cairo, because it was so heavy. Uh, we're obviously a lot lighter now. So the auxiliary power unit, the APU, can come on. Here's Terminal 5. There we go. Too low. Flaps. Whoa. Yeah, something's gone very, very peculiar with Don't the scenery. Sink. Don't sink. That's uh, unusual. <laughs> yeah, thankfully this isn't a lesson on taxiing in FSX scenery. Whoa! Don't sink. Don't sink. <laughs> what on earth was that? Oh, well, that, that's quite amusing. I might go a little bit slower then in that case. If, uh, clearly there's some dodgy object Hello, collision class. going on here. Some very dodgy object collision. Let's just see if we can get past whatever it is causing us the issue. Right, I think we're over it. There's <laughs> some, some very odd collision mesh there. Uh, I'll sort out the scenery, although we won't be doing another flight in Heathrow for this series. Um, we'll be concentrating on VFR, mainly. Um, which will either be in a little Cessna, or maybe, if you're good, a Grob Tutor. Or probably a Grob Heron, actually. I'm not sure if I've got a Tutor, but I've definitely got a Grob Heron. It's the, it's the same thing, it's just got a slightly different propeller on it. Right, we seem to have recovered from the hawky balkiness. Uh, flight director can come off, I don't need that anymore. Also, throttle's fine staying on for now. So, 
the APU on, APU's up and on, so that means we will be able to turn our, back, um, our engines off and we won't lose power. So in we come to gate, yeah, this is 513, off the top of my head, and we will turn the taxi lights off so we don't blind the marshal up that doesn't exist. Yeah, these jetways are like sunken into the ground or something, that's very odd. Uh, yeah, no visual docking guidance either here. I don't know. I don't know what's going on here. It's clearly trying to overlay two different sceneries. I don't know why. We'll have a look. There. That's good enough for me. So, parking brake can go on, which is that pathetic little lever there, and fuel cut off. Did I put the flaps up before I did that? Yeah, I think I did. Shut down, so fuel pumps uh, need to come off. Off, 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 cross feed, shouldn't really have even been on, but whatever. Uh, fuel pumps are off, hydraulic panel can come off as well. Uh, click, click. Might as well do the full shebang. Parking brake can stay on for the moment. Um, we shall open some doors. We'll connect external power. So we can put external power on, so we can turn the APU off. Don't need that anymore. Let me just check. Something's gone very weird now. So, engines are off, parking brake. Yeah, VA Virtual thinks I'm on takeoff for some reason. Well, I know why actually, it's because uh, because of the scenery went a bit hawky hawky. Transponder can come off, and then lastly, we can get a nice few. Oh, lights off. Lights off, lights off, lights off. There we go. And you get to see the cool cabin light in as well. How, how close can I get in on that? Oh, yes, yeah, all. Yeah, you can see it all. Very nice. Cool. There we are. So that's your sort of high level introductory uh, type stuff. Next, we will be in a light aircraft and we will actually look at the instruments and how we set them uh, and we'll do a bit of flight planning as well and we'll do a nice little route uh, probably around East Midlands Airport um, and uh, we'll do some navigation with radio rather than autopilot and just letting the aircraft do it. Hope you enjoyed any questions down below in the doobly-doo I'll do my best to uh, answer them promptly um, but bear in mind I do work so um, it may take me a few hours to reply or a day um, but yeah any questions put them down any comments as well usual thing criticisms if something doesn't look right if the audio is a bit wrong or whatever um, let me know and I can tweak and tune uh, the capture um, just so you're getting the most value I'm purely doing this for you guys um, so any feedback you can give on that would be uh, would be great because it will just make it better for you. Awesome. See you soon. Stay safe. Don't cough too much. Bye.